Thanks, Ravi, for that kind introduction. Uh, let me begin by thanking Deans Filozola and Nessler for the invitation to be here virtually. I, like many of us, I'm waiting for the vaccination for a five for an 11 year old, which is why I'm not traveling. It is a pleasure to participate in this lab coat ceremony, which is an important milestone in your relatively short PhD journey and your long journey as a scientist. And so when I was invited to uh, speak to all of you, um, I had a chance to reflect upon my own journey. Um, I'm marking 20 years since I left India to come to the US for grad school this year. And so what I'm really going to share with you in the next few minutes are what I wish my younger self had known. It is very important to remember that obtaining a PhD or an MD PhD is essentially a lifelong commitment to the service of science, right, and to humanity. In that sense, when many of your college classmates went off to get jobs and, you know, the two and a half kids and the picket fence, you chose this absolute privilege to build a career out of curiosity and discovery. And when we do this, it's a very conscious decision not to spend just the five years or so learning to be a scientist, but also recognizing that it's a choice we make every day. And so when you walk into the lab, when you get to do those experiments, you are enjoying the privilege of following that curiosity. But then when that is such a romantic notion that science should be all these beautiful, amazing things and every experiment should work, the reality is that one has to be very strategic about how to go about science because you don't have coursework, you don't have a syllabus, and sometimes you just don't know what to do. So in what I'm sharing with you, I think there are glimpses of quite a bit of what to do, but maybe some of what not to do. And much of this is very granular, right? It's literally like a, a strategic plan, if you will, and I hope you'll find it useful. So I'll tell you a little bit of my own story and how I came up on uh, Mount Sinai. I have actually, as Ravi mentioned, my background is actually in engineering. And I was uh, working on my master's in chemical engineering at Georgia Tech, uh, where I was working on tissue engineering. Now, the thing with tissue engineering is that um, I'm not joking, I'm only half joking when, you know, a lot of it was done like it's a baking recipe, right? If you put polymer and if you put cells and all of that, at least that's how I was exposed to it. And the tissue just wouldn't grow in the incubator. And I found myself culturing primary cells with absolutely no biology background. And so when uh, life happened to me and I came upon the opportunity to pursue a PhD, I decided I was going to do it in biology because I really wanted to do biology. The further anecdote to this is that when I was in high school in India a very long time ago now, you had to choose between a math track and a biology track. And I really, really hated having to choose one over the other. So I kind of felt like this was a do-over. So I could really go learn biology and figure out what these cells were, were about. And so I landed here. Uh, I must say that the admissions office pre presumably knew none of my letter writers, um, and somehow the grad school took a chance on me, and I'm ever so grateful. And so with that formal journey in biomedical sciences beginning, it was also around the time that biology was more openly quantitative, and the explosion of systems biology served me really well. Ravi has always been at the forefront of interdisciplinary fields. I knew the math and the physics, and I was very fortunate to find such a rich program of research that allowed people like me, who had a mathematical background, to work in biology. Even today, my most favorite thing to do is to draw signal transduction pathways, much to the chagrin of my mechanical engineering graduate students. My point is that I followed my curiosity, you know, the, the storyline reads very romantic and, you know, it's, it's all great, it all worked out, but that's not the entire story then, right? The entire story is that there are people. There are people who played such crucial roles in enabling this to become a realization. So what advice can I give you? Um, in thinking about a lot of what I wanted to share with you, much of it essentially came down to good practice and good discipline uh, so that your scientific careers can fully realize your potential. First and foremost, people. Exceptional biomedical science is about exceptional biomedical scientists. I would strongly recommend that you seek and surround yourself with people who invigorate your thinking, 
who challenge you to question your assumptions, who push you to the edges of comfort, and then who will always have your back. Now, when I say this, it is easy to interpret this message as I just need to be around exceptional scientists and everything else will be okay. It is also important to recognize that kindness and decency and scientific genius are not mutually exclusive traits. You must surround yourself with people who bring out the best on all fronts. It is completely possible to disagree and be polite at the same time. You can uphold integrity and standards while extending grace and kindness. This ultimately is what will shape your approach to research and path-breaking discoveries. And in that spirit, your choice of a research lab, your thesis advisor, your thesis committee are all more important perhaps than the particular project itself. Listen to your peers, interview the PIs while doing your rotations, trust your instincts. More often than not, we all like to believe that a particular situation, which is, it won't happen to us, only to find out later that you can't fit a square peg into a round hole. So who's the square peg, who's the round hole? How do you know? A lot of this comes down to self-awareness. Your self-awareness is key. What kind of mentoring do you like? Do you like a weekly check-in, a daily check-in? Do you like somebody to micromanage your time? Or do you like to be left alone and I'll give you the first draft of the paper? In my own uh, PhD work with Ravi, I have kind of transitioned across all of these. And I, I think it was a lot to Ravi's benefit that he kind of knew when to leave me alone <laughs> and, and when to you know be in my face. And I didn't recognize that at that time because I didn't know better. I think it's important for you to know what you want at different stages and it changes. Do you want a formal mentoring? Do you want informal? What about peer mentoring? Writing groups, journal clubs, these are all these important intangible aspects of scientific research that can really help support you and guide you. The community of the lab is actually a very important thing. While looking for labs to do my postdoc at UC Berkeley, I chose to not join a particularly attractive uh, research program where the PI was an up and coming rock star scientist. Rock star scientist, that's how the campus knew him because of a very simple reason, which was that all the group members went to happy hour with their PI at 6 p.m. most days. I went to pick up the baby from daycare. This by itself is not a reason enough not to join a lab, but a lot of scientific discussions happen over these casual social engagements. And I, was, I would be conspicuous from my absence and that would not necessarily allow me to be creative in the best way possible. I ended up in another group, completely different flavor, smaller, perhaps not as glamorous. And I thrived there. The PI also left at 4.30 p.m. every day to pick up his daughter, and it was the right environment for me at that time. The pace was slower. I took my time to learn a new research area, and it worked out very well for me in the end. So the big challenge when you're still developing the self-awareness is to figure out what you need to do to succeed. And sometimes it is very important to recognize that it is your career, it is your PhD, your PI already has one. You are, you are in charge here. And when you take that control, amazing things can happen. On communication, it is very important to recognize that your PI probably appreciates it much more than you can recognize when you go to them with questions or seeking help on specific topics, or if you wish to discuss career plans. Usually when my students don't say anything to me, I assume everything is fine. Um, I cannot fathom if someone's struggling. So communication is key. And again, figuring out whether you want weekly updates, written reports, group meeting presentations, or all various aspects of this communication. I have to share this little story. I don't know if Ravi remembers this or not, but I used to always wonder, but I already told Ravi this, you know, I'm going on vacation or, I already did this calculation. And the strange thing is because karma kind of gets you in this very same lifetime, in my case, within a decade, 
my students tell me this all the time. I already wrote you an email. I already told you on Slack. I already did this. This is not doable. So it's the strangest thing. It's because our minds can sometimes get very easily distracted by the other things we are doing that it's important for you to communicate and, you know, keep us on our toes, remind us um, what we need. Things like needing a letter uh, of recommendation, a nomination, give your PI enough time so that, you know, they can get it done without having to stay up the night before. Um, and the more you communicate, communicate early, communicate often, the more you'll get out of this relationship. Now, I know we are in a biomedical sciences institution, but I also encourage all of you to think about your career goals. Uh, is it academia? Is it industry? Is it research? Is it policy? It's your career. You should be thinking about it and you know, seek advice on how you might realize that. Yes, during your PhD, you have to make new discoveries and you have to publish your papers, but what happens after? And so you can take charge of a lot of these things. you know, kind of comes down to the brass tacks then, right? What else do I have to say about this? Read, read a lot of papers, read reviews, and then chase down the original finding. If looking for a particular experimental protocol, go back all the way down to the original paper. And then while reading, find a good way of taking notes. This seems so mundane that you might be wondering why is a keynote speaker telling me to take notes? I promise you it'll be so useful when you summarize that paper and then you're writing your own that all you need to do is go grab that little tracy you wrote and stick it in there. Participate in journal clubs, ask seminar speakers questions. It doesn't matter if you are nervous, just you know, ask one small question and then you will ask the next question. It makes a big difference in just trying to learning how to speak up. Well, if you're reading a lot, something we often don't do early, on, early enough is writing a lot. And I'm going to basically say something that's uh, probably not a popular opinion, which is that writing need not wait until all the research is done, all your figures are laid out and beautiful and perfect and you have your sample size so you can um, get everything going. Writing is active research and thinking. The more you write, the more you have to think about what you're doing and why you're doing it. You can use those notes you made from the reading to draft an introduction. What is the gap in the field? Why are you doing this particular experiment? Why is that the most logical experiment to do? In a way, it helps you justify your actions and writing doesn't have to be tedious, doesn't have to be onerous, doesn't have to be sophisticated or elegant or your GRE word list, although I don't think people take GREs anymore. It doesn't have to be very difficult. It can be bullet points. The goal when you write is to strive to have the answer to this one question be yes. Can the reader understand the point of what you've write written without having to talk to you. This is a learned habit. You can form a writing group 30 minutes each day. You can do this. The other thing I wish I had known much earlier, given just how much I write all the time, is making figures, just making schematics. Trying to communicate this complex idea of mechanics in cells with and microtubule and the membrane changing its shape and whatnot and making figures. Humans are visual creatures and figures should be able to tell the story. They don't have to be pretty in the beginning. They can be doodles. Make the figures, label the axes, make sure you have units, small but important things. You know, they'll make a world of difference in the quality of managing your frustration as you go through the research process. Learn to code. Even if you don't think you will ever code, learn to code. You can automate your scripts for plots. You can automate your image analysis. And there are many, many uh, online courses where you can learn to code. And you are in an era of biology where biology is 
the generator of big data and big data needs coding. So if there's one skill that seems as a big aside in biomedical sciences, I would say learn to code. Learn in the same spirit as writing, in the same spirit as reading, use your group meeting presentations to make good talks. I can guarantee you, if you make the talk the night before, your audience will know it. So make try, take the time, prepare your slides, explain every plot. I know this sounds like so granular, but if you have a plot up there, you have to explain it. And hey, Zoom advantage, you can video your own talk record it and see how it sounds and then practice on it, right? So you don't need to call your friends to say, hey, I want to give a practice talk. You can listen to it yourself. So, you know, small advantages of Zoom. So these are all the sort of granular things you can do. But then if you take a step back and you look at this five-year journey, the strangest thing is finding the way to lift oneself up when the research process inherently sets you up with more setbacks than flashes of insights. I know there are families on this call. I know many of you will go home for Thanksgiving and Christmas, and there will be cousins who got a raise, and uh, you know uh, everybody is doing amazing, amazingly well. In my own case, people turn to me and say, so have you finished school yet? Oh, no, 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 I got this amazing result that I'm going to put in this paper, and my advisor says it's going to go to sell. Oh, so you're still in school. Right, so it's a you're living in this little bubble that is so different. So you strong, and then it can become this thing known as imposter syndrome. So I think if you add that peer-to-peer -peer comparison, then it's easy to ask. The, you become vulnerable. It's easy to ask this question: Do I belong? And so finding mentors outside of your PI who can lift you up, who can guide you through this, is very important. Remember, no one mentor can do everything. Sometimes the PI just has to focus on the scientific aspects. So find your find your mentors, right? So uh, when I was at Sinai, professors uh, Terry Krolwich uh, and uh, Maria Diverse Pierre Lucy were the people I would just go talk to and be like, "This thing is not working. I don't know what I'm modeling." And they would, you know, listen to me for 30 minutes and it, give me some advice, and then I would go back and try again. And you can also have peer mentors, right? Your, your lab mates or many of you classmates, you can have peer mentors and it can be even outside the institution, but don't let, if possible, don't let the imposter syndrome get to you. The most critical feature in, for longevity in a scientific career is perseverance and resilience. You're not necessarily born with it. Those are learned skills that you can have. And as we talk so much about what it takes to do science and to be a scientist, it is also important to remember that you live in one of the most vibrant cities in the world. When I was young and I was cool, I lived in Manhattan. And you're a stone's throw away from Central Park. Make the time to get out, take a walk, exercise, and muddle through the data that seems to make no sense. Make sure to give yourself that time and you'll be amazed at how small breaks can rejuvenate your thinking and provide clarity where they might have, where you might have just troubled for like hours on end. And finally, I will leave you with this. We are all biased. It is human nature. It is important to recognize that we all have it and we work actively against it. If you won't say something to a man, don't say it to a woman. Don't expect that it's okay to make assumptions in terms of anything, appearance, sexual orientation, gender, ethnicity, race, religion. Be kind, extend grace. Apologize if you make a mistake and don't make the same mistake twice. If you see biased behavior, speak up. A silent bystander is as bad as a perpetrator. Like they say in the New York City subway, if you see something, say something, be that person. Be respectful of others and be respectful of yourself. Being right and being kind are not mutually exclusive. And now I wish you the very best of success and I hope you put on your lab coats, go forth and conquer the world. Thank you very much.